Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and to be here with all of you. So today, as Brian said, he's asked me to speak about HHV8 related disease and people living with HIV, but not to focus on Kaposi sarcoma because my understanding is that you've discussed several cases of Kaposi sarcoma recently and are feeling comfortable with that. So as you know, HHV8 is also known as Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. And in one study of about 1,000 US blood donors, 7% of them had serologic evidence of HHV8. But in fact, none of these 1,000 healthy people who were donating blood after all, had HHV8 viremia. And this becomes important later as we talk about some of the disorders associated with HHV8. So normal people, don't have HHV8, normal healthy people don't have HHV8 circulating in their blood. So the HHV8 related diseases, Kaposi sarcoma, as you all know, the most common cancer associated with living with HIV, Castleman disease, which, which is rare, but we see several cases of it per year here at the University of Washington, primary effusion lymphoma, also rare, but we see a case or two a year, and then a very rare syndrome called Kicks, which we'll talk about briefly, though not uh, truly not much is known about Kicks at this point. I just wanted to make you aware of this emerging syndrome. And so this is the only slide I have about Kaposi sarcoma. This is the classic picture of a man presenting with painless, raised, deep purple lesions on his skin, and this is classic Kaposi sarcoma. And what we're going to focus on today is mostly Castleman disease. And what this is, is a polyclonal lymphoproliferative disease with flares. And so people are relatively well, and then they fairly suddenly get ill over a period of a few days. And they present with a flu-like illness, fever, tender adenopathy, don't touch my lymph nodes, doctor. These lymph nodes hurt. So it's not like lymphoma, where generally the lymph nodes are painless unless they've been growing very, very fast. But they have a tender adenopathy that develops very quickly. The nodes can be the size of a lemon in a few days. Splenomegaly, again tender, and they often get cytopenias, often pancytopenia, a low white count, a hemoglobin in the eight range, you know, platelet count in the 50,000 range. They can also have pulmonary symptoms like shortness of breath or peripheral edema, and about a, they tend to be fairly ill. About a third of these patients with Castleman disease are actually admitted to the intensive care unit. So they can be very sick very fast. So when you see somebody with a rapidly progressive illness with tender adenopathy and low blood counts, this should be in your differential diagnosis. About half of these patients also have Kaposi sarcoma because, of course, of the HHV8 virus that is common to both. So how do we make the diagnosis of Castleman disease? Well, just like the case that, Brian, you were discussing very briefly at the beginning of this session, a biopsy is necessary. And so you want to get, an, ideally, an excisional biopsy or an incisional biopsy. So either the whole lymph node or a wedge of the pie of the lymph node. We prefer to avoid the needle biopsies because they really don't give us enough tissue to, to tell what's going on. So, uh, so an excisional biopsy of a lymph node shows the classic features of Castleman disease. It has plasmablastic cells, and these contain HHV8. So the HHV8 virus is actually found in the plasmablastic cells. The CRP, the, a marker of inflammation, is often high. It's usually tenfold normal. I've seen them up to 200 with Castleman disease. Normal's in the, you know, five range, but they, they are often, the CRP is often very high, and the plasma HHV8 viral load is often high. And this is one of the cases where you might order a HHV8 viral load, where it can be helpful in the differential diagnosis. And so the, the range, it's on the average 30,000, or the median is 30,000 copies per mil. I've seen it up to a million with Castleman disease. And just to compare and contrast, in somebody who's got stable Kaposi sarcoma, their HHV8 viral load may be undetectable or it may be 200 or 300, somewhere in that range. 
And so uh, people with stable Kaposi's sarcoma really don't have these levels of circulating HHV8 viremia. And what is the pathophysiology of Castleman disease? And this becomes important as we think about treatment options. Well, the HHV8 viral genome encodes a homolog of human IL-6, interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory cytokine. And when that HHV8 load gets very high during a flare of Castleman's, the IL-6 levels, which can be measured in, in research labs, we don't measure them clinically, the IL-6 levels are also very, very high. And the concept is that IL-6 both you know, leads to the cytokine storm you get with, with Castleman disease and also stimulates the polyclonal growth of the B lymphocytes that you see in these enlarged tender lymph nodes. And how do we treat Castleman's flare? What I would recommend is using rituximab. This is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody and we give a specific dose intravenously once a week for four weeks in a row. And there have been small clinical trials involving 20 patients, 30 patients, 40 patients, so, so really pretty small clinical trials. And these show that the response rate to rituximab is about 90%. And it often occurs within hours to days. People feel better even during the infusion of rituximab. It latches on to those CD20 positive B cells in the lymph nodes, and patients, you know, very rapidly respond, and, it, and the response lasts more than six months. One of the things you need to think about if you're going to treat somebody with Castleman disease with rituximab is there are pretty clear data that Kaposi's sarcoma can get worse during that treatment. And so if you have a little bit of Kaposi's on your skin, that's not such a big deal. But if you have pulmonary involvement with Kaposi's, you'd want to really think about this. And sometimes we have to treat the Kaposi's concurrently with the Castleman's because you wouldn't want a flare of pulmonary Kaposi's in your patient. I don't recommend siltuximab. This is a rationally designed treatment. The pathophysiology is high IL-6. Let's make a monoclonal antibody against IL-6. And in fact, it works well. I'm a Corey Casper here at you know, the University of Washington has participated in clinical trials of siltuximab and it, it does work. It's approved by the FDA for HIV negative people. The problem with siltuximab is you have to give it every three weeks and you have to give it continuously. And so it's, it's not like rituximab where you give four doses and you're done and people have sustained responses. So you can use siltuximab, it's certainly available and FDA approved, but it doesn't give you a sustained response. Other approaches that, that some expert clinicians would use include antiviral treatment to suppress HHV8 itself. And if the patient is very, very sick, sometimes we'll give a standard chemotherapy regimen, rituximab plus some chemotherapy agents. But usually what we do is we treat the patients with rituximab, and this is usually very effective. In current reports, the median survival of people with HIV-associated Castleman disease is 12 years. So this is something you, you treat, and people are going to live a long time. And if they relapse, which some do, you can retreat them with rituximab. So this is a diagnosis you'd like to make because we have very effective therapy for it. We do need to monitor these patients long term because about one in five of them will eventually develop a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So you have to have a high index of suspicion if things are not going well to consider a repeat biopsy because they have a much higher risk of lymphoma. And as I mentioned, some will relapse with Kesselman disease. And so when I follow these patients after treatment, I about every three months for the first couple of years, I check the CRP and the HHV8 viral load in their blood because if the CRP starts to go up and the HHV8 viral load starts to go up again, that may be heralding a, a relapse, in which case you want to treat them before they get to the ICU. So let's move on and talk about another HHV8-related disease, which is primary effusion lymphoma. And this is a very aggressive B-cell lymphoma that comes in presents usually with pleural effusions. That's the most common. Second most common would be ascites. And the third most common would be pericardial effusions. And so all of these samples are going to be HHV8 positive, And quite a few are also har harbor the Epstein-Barr virus. 
And the key point is when you see somebody living with HIV and they have a new pleural effusion, unless it's very clear to you why they have the pleural effusion, when you do the diagnostic tap, to also send the tap for flow cytometry and cytology because that's how we make the diagnosis of primary fusion lymphoma. So included in your differential diagnosis when somebody comes in with a, a, an effusion and just include the flow cytometry and the cytology. And if they have primary fusion lymphoma, you'll make the diagnosis that way. This is much more common in men than in women, about a 10 to 1 ratio. And it occurs in people with CD4s in the you know, 100 to 200 range most commonly. So how do we treat it? Well, we give them multi-agent chemotherapy, such as an infusion, infusional regimen called EPOC. And it's very important to either initiate or to continue effective ART, because it's very important to treat both the lymphoma and the HIV for best outcome. This is an aggressive lymphoma. Almost all of them get better with chemotherapy, but unfortunately, a lot of them relapse in the, in the next one to two years. But some are cured. I have one patient I've seen, I've, I treated 15 years ago who's still doing his artwork, which is great. I want to just say a word or two about a novel syndrome that we, about which we don't know very much, to tell you the truth. There's a nice reference there at the bottom, which is clinical infectious diseases from three months ago, which is the largest case series available, and it's 10 patients. So that gives you a perspective. And, and what this is, Kix syndrome, the KSHV-associated inflammatory cytokine syndrome, it's a serious, severe inflammatory illness like Castleman disease, but when you do a lymph node biopsy, they don't see Castleman disease. And patients tend to come in with, with disabling fatigue, gastrointestinal systems such as you know, anorexia, nausea, diarrhea, peripheral edema, dyspnea. Also, they have pancytopenia often. In the first, that case series of 10, 100% of those patients had also had Kaposi sarcoma. And again, the HHV8 viral load in the blood is very high, it tends to be in the 30,000 to 100,000 per mil range. So this is a highly morbid syndrome, and there's no clear treatment recommendations available in the literature. There's just a handful of cases and small case series. So we'd have to put our heads together if you see a case like that. I have seen two or three of them. And so I'd like to just summarize what we've talked about. The HHV8-related diseases, the most common by far is Kaposi sarcoma, which you've all seen a lot of. We diagnose that by a biopsy. Castleman disease, which we diagnose by lymph node biopsy. And you also want to check the HHV8 viral load and the, uh, the CRP. Primary fusion lymphoma, we diagnose that by flow cytometry and cytology when you tap the pleural or the effusion or the ascites or other effusion. And kicks. and there's that working case definition in this article that I have up here with specific clinical findings, a very high CRP, high HHV8 viral load, and no evidence of Castleman disease on biopsy. And patients may have more than one of these, and they often, these syndromes related to HHV8 often do coexist in the same patient. And thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any.